Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 232 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. What's happening, Barb? How are you? I'm good, thank you. We have not talked to you since the big triathlon. Yes. How'd it go? You won the whole thing, right? <laughs> no, but I think oh. I did all right. I probably, um, well, let's put it this way. Lake Michigan was super choppy. Every time I took a stroke, I put some water in, so I kind of panicked a little bit. Then the fact threw it, went my bike ride, and then I killed the run. So I was happy, of course. With, I was happy with yeah. it. Yeah. Anybody kick you in the head this time? Yes. Some <laughs> off but yeah like i said i panicked a little bit because it was really rough out there for me and i'm not a swimmer so i just kept counting my strokes and praying to god that i just get to the end of the swim so i could get back on land but i'll do it again next year i enjoyed it yeah. i love cross training i raised over eighty four hundred dollars thank you everybody okay. that helped donate yeah so sean nowak came in second so i got him a second place trophy <laughs> yeah, doing at the dinner which he appreciated thoroughly hopefully he's listening because he always does thanks sean is this the first time you beat sean no no okay i wasn't sure it's just the first time that he went all over facebook saying he was going to beat me and you know what happens when somebody challenges me little spike trophies purchased a little bit competitive yeah i got it on amazon it was super cool it. that's awesome <laughs> no that's great thank you for raising all the money thank you for your support good job on the race we love it all right. Let's uh, do it again next year, shall thank we? Thank you uh, for your congratulations on our page. I appreciated it. It was fun. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. All right. Do you remember when we chatted with Beth Brown way back on episode 199? That was a long time ago. It seemed like it was decades ago, but it really wasn't that long ago. <laughs> but she was that super sweet dental technician from the UK who's also super oh, yeah. popular on Instagram. Yes, I do. Known as the Party Enamel, which is by far the coolest Instagram (laughs) name for a dental technician. So true. But since we talked to her, her passion for dental technology has grown a ton. Not only did she move across the world to Australia to learn more, I know, she has created a training platform designed specifically for technicians. It's pretty cool. You head over to the Party Enamel. Dot com to see all the courses that she's put together. That's crazy. It's cool. It, there's only a few right now. But what's really exciting? Beth reached out to me and she's looking for other technicians willing to teach a course on her site. Oh, I can do that. There you go. See, I know there's a lot of technicians out there that feel they have a lot to teach. But getting in front of a group might be a little intimidating or you just don't know how to connect with a vendor to set up a course. Right. Beth at thepartyenamel.com might just be the perfect platform for some of you. What she tells me is anyone that teaches a course on her website basically has complete control. Right. You get to create the content, set the price, make some money, brand it to you or your company, and just start teaching people your skills. What would you teach, Barb? Ceramics? I would teach how to, um, honestly, final contour, surface texture, and stain and glaze with Mio. Yeah. Final I think, I think contour. It's all, in the, uh, all in the shapes and the contour at this point because you've got so many multi layer materials. Yeah. But I think contouring right now is where it's at. So, texture, lobes, paracamata, incisal edge placement, planes. And then just how to jazz it all up when you glaze it. It's my favorite thing to do. You should do it. You know, should teach but... a course. That would be great. Thanks. I think I'll check it out. We'll definitely hype it here, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like a great idea. Don't let Barb be the only one teaching a class. I know there's a lot of you out there with a lot to teach. So head over to partyenamel.com and go to the contact page. Or you can reach out to her on Instagram at partyenamel. And let her know you want to teach the industry something cool. That's awesome. Barb will be on there next. Mm-hmm. If you charge $100 a person, you need 1000 But if you charge $10,000, you only need one person. How's that? <laughs> Where do you come from? I don't know. <laughs> I need help. All right. What's happening this week? So this week, I had the great pleasure to talk to a man all the way from Ireland that make dentures that suck. 
Well, I was doing something, right? Yeah, what were you doing? Probably working. I don't working. know. God, you wouldn't work. I've had a couple lately. It's been a, I've had a few hiccups. My apologies to Paul. It's all good. But while you were doing something, <laughs> I got to have a wonderful conversation with Paul McNally. Paul was a carpenter when the economy made him look elsewhere for employment. Finding dead on technology, it wasn't long before Paul became a denturist and then a teacher for the Japanese method that creates a mandibular denture that won't come out by just doing everything right and there's no implants. Huh. So that's the suction denture. Oh yeah. Paul talks about the history of denturism in Ireland, his practice, the courses he teaches, and what exactly makes the suction denture suck so much. Plus, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's it's great. All good. That's, that's why I did it. <laughs> Plus, he's got an amazing Irish accent. Oh, yeah. Which is super fun to listen to. Uh-huh. So join us as we chat with Paul McNally. Whitmix is thrilled to announce their most recent addition to their milling product line. Introducing the DWX 53DC from DG Shape. This powerful mill satisfies your need for speed. Three reasons to consider this mill one, it has three times the gripping power for PMMA, two, it mills 30% faster, and three, the integrated webcam allows you to monitor a milling project from anywhere on any device. Head over to tinyurl.com slash Mill. That's the word tiny, the letters U-R-L, dot com forward slash Whitmix, R-O-L-A-N-D, Mill. Or head over to this episode's show notes for a link. And as always, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. Voices from the Bench, The Interview. We are excited to welcome to the podcast, for the first time, a gentleman from Dublin, Ireland. I'm super excited about this. Paul McNally, how are you, sir? I'm very good, Elvis, and I'm not trying to correct you. I'm actually from Carlo in Ireland. So Carlo, okay. Carlo. Yes, so we're, we're about an hour southeast of Dublin. Yeah, is it one of those things where if somebody mentions you're from Dublin, you get upset, or I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I do apologize. No, Let's no, edit. No, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where somebody calls you by the wrong name and you leave them, continue the conversation, and half an hour in, they're still calling you Dave. Yeah, okay, I totally <laughs> get it. I totally get it. Well, Dave, tell us. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, Paul, I believe you're kind of like. In America, we call it denturist. You're able to see patients, but you still have a huge technical background, correct? Correct, yes. Our title is slightly different here. We are still denturist, just with a different title. So the title here and in the UK is clinical dental technician. So sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. When I see CDT, the initials beside somebody in the United States, that means certified dental technician. But here it, it means clinical dental technician. Yeah, I wonder if whoever came up with them, we didn't check each other. It it is confusing. Yeah, I I mean, look, I think we should all have the same title, Elvis, worldwide. But uh, at the moment, we have the grin and bear with clinical dental technician versus dental technician. Yeah, so sorry about my dogs. Okay. So tell us your story, Paul. I mean, how did you get into it? Uh, It's it's actually, it's quite a a long, drawn-out story. (laughs) I love it. We have a whole hour, so shoot away. Almost by accident, Elvis. So when I finished school, believe it or not, I actually I went off to study electronic engineering. Oh. And I was about possibly a year into, in, into college with electronic engineering, but I wasn't very good at kind of, I suppose, sitting down with books and that. I'm a very kind of touchy-feely guy who likes to, to work with my hands. And I actually always had a grow for kind of working with, with timber, believe it or not. So... About a year after college, I, I left and I, I decided I wanted to be a carpenter. Oh, okay. Electrical to carpentry. Yep. I see where this leads directly to teeth. Yep. Yeah, electronic engineering to carpentry. So I have, I have actually junior trades in, in carpentry and joinery. 
Well, this is going back 1990, 1991. And at that time here in Ireland, the, the building trade was basically on its knees. So there was very, very little work for carpenters, joiners, block layers, electricians. It was really quiet. You were going out into a world where there wasn't any work. Why wasn't there any work? There was, we were in the middle of a recession at the time. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. So the, the building trade was extremely quiet and the, the job prospects were poor at the time. Sure, sure. Um, so I had, like, when I was in school, I did some work experience with, uh, so in kind of what we have in, in fourth year in secondary school, mm-hmm. you have an option to do a year that's kind of like a call a transition year. So you're between kind of junior and senior cycles in school. So you get a year where you can may- maybe sample different types of industries and so on. So I had kind of yeah, dipped okay. in electrical and so on. But part of my work experience involved me working in a local dental laboratory here. So to kind of tell you how I got into that, um, I was uh, heavily involved in, in cycling. So I represented Ireland as an international cyclist. Um, what? And- really? Yeah, at one point in time. So <laughs> one of our club members owned a dental laboratory. And so I had done a little stint there, kind of helping out, making the tea and the coffee and sweeping the floor and oh, going okay. to yep. ask, ask for models and so on. But I wasn't living in Carlow at the time. I was living in Watford, but I used to come home occasionally. And I came home one particular weekend and my mom and dad said that the the, the owner of the dental laboratory had been around to see was I interested in an apprenticeship in dental technology. So at that time, I'm going back now, 19, 1993, um, you had two ways to become a dental technician in Ireland. There was an apprenticeship, which mm-hmm. was called, uh, the actual title of it, it was Dental Crafts Person. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of generic. <laughs> it's a dental Crafts Person. And there was also an option to do a four-year full-time uh, course in Dublin Dental University Hospital. So I, I opted to become an apprentice uh, dental technician, and uh, so that, that was a four-year apprenticeship, which I think it was actually the best way to learn the trade because you were immediately thrown at the coal face, where yeah. a lot of the time with, the, I suppose, I'm not trying to slay it, but I think it's, it's probably a lot in, in colleges all over the world where they possibly had the theory, but when they're put into the real world of commercial laboratories where uh, time is money that uh, the two don't go hand in hand so oh yeah you make one denture in school in a week in a <laughs> yeah. week yeah. Yeah. yeah you got plenty of time well that's it the, the, the guy on a I perfect used... model <laughs> absolutely the, the guy that i used to work for and um, he was from northern ireland and uh, mm-hmm. is one of his like he used to time us at everything so every job that we got he would tell if it was pouring a model, if it was making a bike block, he had a set amount of time that was allowed for each task and you would be getting a countdown. So if a bike block was 15 minutes and you're 10 minutes in, he was giving you a countdown. You have five minutes left to complete that. And uh, <laughs> he, so he, wow. to say, he would say, don't be making love to it. Get it out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so uh, midway through that, that apprenticeship, um, the organizing body for training dental technicians through the apprenticeship, we actually washed their hands of it about two years into the course. So there was a bunch of us in the country here, about maybe 14 or 15 of us that were kind of almost left high and dry at the end of the four years where we didn't have an official kind of certification or title. It's something we had to fight for. So they got rid of the apprentice program while you were in it? While we were in it, yes. Oh, man. Wow. Okay. While we're, it gets more complicated as we go on, believe me. <laughs> okay. But in Ireland, just to give you a little bit of background, like we yeah. still currently here don't have a register for dental technicians in Ireland. We have a register for clinical dental technicians like ourselves. So denturists, dentists, you know, uh, dental hygienists, dental nurses, there is a register for all of them. But there's still currently no register for dental technicians in this country. Same thing with America, basically. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Anybody can open up a dental lab. Yeah. It's a bit like becoming an auctioneer, you know, anybody can chance their arm at it. But uh, yes, I mean, I I finished the four-year apprenticeship there without any actual quality or title, I suppose. Luckily, one of the other apprentices, uh, his boss kind of really pursued i suppose the people who had had organized the apprenticeship said you can't leave these young guys high and dry without any official 
qualification at the end of it all or title. Yeah. So we did, we did manage to get that, but it was it was numerous years after the four year apprenticeship was up. What motivated you to finish the four years if you knew nothing was going to be there at the end of the? <sighs> what else was I going to do at that stage? You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, you know, do I go back and go through the university program and do four years again? Or do I hope that somebody will pull the finger out and sort it? So I opted for the latter. Yeah, wow. It took an awful lot longer than possibly if I had went down the the college route. But look, in, in hindsight, Elvis, I think it was, it was probably the best thing because I think a lot of times maybe people come out after four years thinking I can go and open a business. And I honestly believe that it takes most people about 10 years to become proficient. Oh yeah. Yeah. Some longer. (laughs) Yeah. Some longer, but I think, I think a minimum. Uh, So I ended up staying in that particular laboratory for 10 years and uh, we opened up our own dental laboratory then in 2003. Who's we, you and the owner? Me and me and my wife. Uh, Oh, nice. uh, Yeah. So she still works here. She like, we've got four kids and my wife, Olivia looks after the running of the business. She, manages all the patients and everything she works five mornings a week because we've four kids from kind of nine, 19 17 14 and 11 um, so she's busy running around after those yeah, yeah. So, yeah so olivia looks after the run the day-to-day running of the clinic so we opened up the laboratory but at that point in time like i said the clinical qualification didn't come into ireland and the uk until 2008 and um, so where Dentura's title in places like Australia and Canada, New Zealand has been around since the 1950s, not in, mm-hmm. in Ireland or the UK since, until 2008. Wow. So what brought that on? Who, who started that movement? Well, I mean, there were a bunch of very brave dental technicians here in Ireland who decided to, to opt to go and do the George Brown course in, in mm-hmm. Toronto. They went off, they embarked on that course uh, and it was, I don't know how long that course is, it's possibly three years. Yep. But they went and embarked on that course. It was part of it meant them going back and forward to the UK and then eventually going to Canada, but not knowing at the end of it all if they were going to be able to practice here in Ireland. Now, yeah. luckily, after they finished, they had obviously done enough work with the dental council and the dental hospital in Ireland and so on to, to have the qualification pushed through. So they came back to been allowed to open up and practice luckily luckily for them and luckily for us because they, they paved the way for us you know yeah but i mean what do they have to do like here in america you got to legislative and go to the government get lobby is that the same thing over there yeah i'm the wrong guy to answer all of those questions sure 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 but i'm sure like i said they were very brave to go and do that and they obviously asked the right questions to the right right people so the qualification was brought in here in 2008 now the training for clinical dental technicians wasn't available here for about two years after that so oh, if you yeah. if you wanted to be a, a clinical dental technician you had to go to the uk or to canada to do the training mm-hmm. it was only available here in 2010 now i, I didn't embark on the the first course i enrolled in the second one so I was in the second cohort that went in in 2012. So you did the training there in Ireland? I did the training yeah. here in Dublin Dental University Hospital in Dublin, yes. How big was the class? There was only there was nine of us that started. Yep. Uh, so, uh, nine started, um, eight finished. It was 18-month-long course, but it was three days per week. Hmm. Uh, so it, it did... It, I would have preferred to do it, honestly, over probably a longer period of time. It... It meant that for for me to do that training, Elvis, I had to close the laboratory three three days a week. Oh yeah. And I was a one man. Well, I don't mean a one man lab, but I was I was one dental technician with my wife running the place. So if sure. the, if the business was closed Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday every week, there was no money being made. Yeah. So it it made it extra difficult. Um, our course involved like it was three days full time. You might as well say so. Tuesday, we had clinic and um, we would have a dentalist clinic in the morning, partially dentate in the afternoon. And then the other two days involved all of the other subjects, the anatomy, the histology, the material science and all the other stuff that goes along with with universities. And um, some of it I would have thought irrelevant to the to the course, but it still had to be uh, like writing a 5000 word essay on the physiology of pain. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah, I, don't no, know, I get it. I don't know how, how that uh, relates to dental. But look, it was 18 months. It was the hardest thing that I ever did, but also the best thing. Yeah. So at the time, your lab, completely removable? Completely removable. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you never dabbled in fixed at all. That was your no. passion from the beginning. It was always my, my passion, removable. Yeah. And I, I think even kind of in, in hindsight, looking back, like I'm thinking back, like I said, I'm almost 30 years at it. And maybe, you know, five or 10 years into it, the guys that were into crown and bridge and implants were saying, you need to get into this. There's going to be no business in removable. <laughs> I think that the, the guys there that were doing the crown and bridge back then probably would prefer to have been involved in the removable because it opened up avenues, like I said, to become uh, a clinical dental technician or a denturist and so on, you know. Graduating from the clinical school, how soon was it before you opened up seeing patients? We actually graduated in, well, we we finished and we got our exam results in January of 2014. But okay. our graduation ceremony wasn't until June of that year. So we had to have our official scroll so we could actually go and register with the Dental Council of Ireland. So we didn't we didn't actually start seeing patients until June uh, 2014. Oh, wow. Yeah, so there was a six-month kind of pause between being actually finished the course and being open. Now, it, again, that was a good time because it, it gave us time. We moved premises and we needed more space because we yep. weren't just we were no longer just a laboratory. We needed space for a clinic. We needed space for waiting rooms and disinfection areas and so on. So it gave us time to kind of to move and then get equipped and kind of up to speed and so on. So yeah, June, uh, kind of late June, 2014, we opened to see patients. And are you still the only technician or at this point, are you hiring technicians to help? No, no. There, I mean, I still work at the bench myself. It's kind of you know, I see some colleagues that, you know, they do the clinical part only and they're, they're, they're not involved in the technical part. Mm-hmm. I I think that the whole benefit of being a denturist or a clinical dental technician is that you're involved in, in the actual manufacturing of the prosthesis as well. I enjoy doing both. So I, I have one other dental technician and myself and my wife. And now we did have five people here at one stage. So I did have three dental technicians. But in order to keep those really busy Elvis because we weren't doing work for probably maybe the first 12 months when we opened we continued to service the dental profession so we were still you know people could send their impressions in and so on and we made appliances but I realized very quickly probably after about six months that I I was cancelling my my own patients in order to make a denture whoever for somebody that I was getting a fraction of the price for and it just Mm. made no no business sense for us to continue down that route so um probably about yeah 10 to 12 months after that we stopped doing work for anybody else we had more than enough to keep us busy and we got to the point like i said where i had three dental technicians but there are only roughly about 40 clinical dental technicians in the whole entire country mm. i have room and space here to put another chair in and i could no doubt fill a book you know, or of appointments every day, but there are just no other clinical dental technicians knocking around. So I just decided to keep it small and beautiful. Yeah, better to control too. That's it. I'm not, I'm not after volume. I'm after quality and I want the patients to be happy and I like to take my time with the work. Yeah. How did your previous clients take it that you started seeing patients? Did you get any pushback or were they pretty accepting? Some of some of them were. Um, <laughs> it's, it's funny kind of like some of, I don't want to call myself one of the younger ones, but like I'm, I'm, I'm 48 years of age, but I did have some older clients that possibly didn't see, like I said, because it's such a new qualification here. Mm-hmm. I think there was a certain element of that, you know, we shouldn't be doing it. I think that when, when we opened up as a clinic, some of those clients never referred patients to us uh, to see directly. Yeah. Some of the guys that were more of, of our age, like one guy in, in particular, he's, his clinic is literally 200 yards from our front door. And he just said, I'm so happy, he said, that you're doing this because he said, one, I don't like doing it. He <laughs> said, Two, he said, you're better at it. And he said, I can make money easier ways than making removable dental prosthesis. So, yeah. I really only needed two or three people of that mind to refer people to me for me to be busy enough. 
Yeah, sure. And it sounds like it's a universal relationship. Yeah. You hear about other denturists, even the ones here in the States, you know, even though there's only legal in a couple states. But if they get a few dentists that are like, heck yeah, I'm sending them, then that's all you need. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, there was a time I can remember here as, as a dental laboratory where we may have had 200 cases sitting on the shelf, you know, mm. 200 cases constantly on the go. And, you know, they often say like a, a busy fool, a silly fool. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want it to have 200 cases anymore. You know, 20, 25 or 30 cases is enough for me. And as like, we take more time about doing the work now is because we command a bigger fee for our work. So it's not about kind of just, you know, turning over things. I want to take my time and, and, and charge appropriately for the work as well. Yeah. Are you allowed to advertise directly to the public? We are. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. do you do that? Well, we do from time to time. Like we have, I suppose in the in the beginning, we would have advertised to local newspapers in the beginning because, again, a lot of our clientele uh, here in Ireland would be particularly of the age where maybe not all of them are using, you know, social media or sure. you know, not online. So we were advertising through local newspapers. But then I live in a small enough town here. There's only 20,000 people in the town. Mm-hmm. In that 20,000, there are probably 20 dentists. And like I said, I have four or five that refer regular uh, patients to me. And I have people now that refer from much further afield than that as well we would have people that come from the four corners of ireland from treatment uh, Sorry, I don't know. that that come and and book in to stay in in local hotels while their treatment has been continued oh and wow so yeah we do some advertising through like we have a facebook campaign which we run from time to time i don't handle it um, and yeah. somebody externally manages that for us as well but from time to time when we get like at the moment i i paused it for the last three months because we were just getting to the point where somebody was ringing for an appointment and said, I can't see you for two months. Yeah, that's not, I mean, it's a good problem to have, but not a good problem. To have. It's, not a good, it's not a good problem. <laughs> so, I mean, if somebody rings and they're saying, yeah, I can't see you until September. So we, we pause it from time to time. And when things get a little bit slacker, then we would just, we boost it again and get it up and running. And so we kind of turn it on and off like a tap as we need it. Yeah. Sounds like you really don't need it too much. No, not really. As like I said, it's it's small enough. Word of mouth seems to do enough, and our regular referrals from our our local dentists keep us more than busy. So, do you usually see patients that are currently in dentures, or ones that need to be put in dentures, or what's your uh, both? Uh, so, a mixture of both. I mean, we would have a lot of people who were, would say, like getting dentures for the first time. So we work hand in hand, like with our our local dentist. So we just say, for instance, somebody comes in and then they've got teeth that are unrestorable and the only option is extraction for them then you know mm-hmm. we you know hand in hand we work we work together if it's immediate dentures we have the dentures manufactured and the teeth are extracted by the dentist 200 yards from our front door and we fit them so you know people are not so we we it's a mixture of both of us uh, a mixture yeah. of people that are having new dentures made and then a mixture of of people that are having them for the first time we're a little bit different to the UK as well, where we have direct access to partially dentate patients, where the UK, they don't. They have to have, um, in the UK, they need a prescription from a dentist to, to work on them. We don't in Ireland. So you're able to make partials that seat on natural teeth? Absolutely. Now, I mean, hmm. when I say that we have direct access, I still automatically refer them. So when, when they come to me for a consultation... The first port of call is, is is our local dentist for for a checkup. Yeah, make sure everything is okay. It just makes common sense. Yep. And do you usually have a set of referral doctors you send to? Yes. To yeah, make sure they okay. they'll send the patient back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, I mean, look, that that has happened to us probably like everybody. You know, where <laughs> you send somebody and then six months later you say see that guy never came back to me, and then you realize <laughs> yeah. the patient's been stolen on you. But no, it's kind of like probably four referring dentists in our, our town that we constantly refer back and forward to. And I, I'm guaranteed yeah. and I send them for, for checkup or restorative work that they're coming back to me. Yeah. So are you able to take final impressions for partials and everything? Yes. Yes. And what about you refer back to the dentist when you need like rest seats and... Yes. So we would, yeah. we would have them do all of that kind of beforehand. So if we're making frameworks and I don't have space and I need rest seats, uh, whatever, I, I will just, we'll do the study cast, we'll articulate and we'll mark where, 
we want the rest seats cut and then the dentist will sort them out before we take our final impressions and so on. Yes. Yeah. Do you make the frameworks yourself? No. No, we've never made uh, frameworks. They're probably like 99% of dental laboratories. We would have outsourced the metal part of it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Recently, in the, we have got invested in digital and so on in, in the last two years. So all of our frameworks now are laser centered and we get them oh, done. Wow. In, we get them done in Germany. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes. And I actually don't, to tell you the truth, Elvis, I don't even, I make suggestions. I, I don't have the time to be sitting down specifically designing every single case so i pay a design fee for the the frameworks it, it's, it's around 20 euros for the design fee on them but the guys that we work with they're, they're a big dental laboratory called iprodens in hanau in germany mm-hmm. so i would like scan the model scan the bite i email off the, the the files and then i'll make a suggestion on what type of framework i'd like whether that's a, a skeletal or a horseshoe type or what type of class or where i'd like the rest seats And then usually maybe 24 hours later, I'll have a design in my inbox. And I may ask them to change X, Y, or Z. Once we have agreed on a design, um, I just ask them to go to production. And it's it's such a swift and efficient service compared with the, the analog version. Like from the time that I actually agree on a design, roughly three days later, UPS are, are knocking the door here with a framework in, in the box. That's pretty amazing. It's really, and I mean, the amount of work that I have to do, remember that the master model actually never leaves the clinic here. Yeah. Maybe six to seven times out of 10, it will just slip onto the master model without any adjustment. And maybe two or three times I have a tiny little bit of adjustment to the basal surface, maybe here or there. And yeah. like we've been doing it this way for the last kind of two and a half years. And it's just brilliant. Yeah. So let's talk about the digital. When did you get into it? Were you into it before you started seeing patients? Uh, no, no. Like, so I, and, and still at the moment, uh, I'm kind of dabbling a little bit in and out. I'd, I'd be a bit like uh, Eugene Rosengart as well, where he calls it digital. Yeah. So we use an, a mixture of both, but all of our dentures that are fitted at the end have been, you know, are, if you want to call it the end result was handmade, what's in their mouth. There yep. may have been some digital processes along the way, but at the moment we're still, you know, flasking and packing and injection molding the, the final dentist and, the, you know, they're all being hand articulated and the teeth set up by hand. So we're using a mixture of, of both to achieve the best result that we possibly can. Yes, but you're still doing everything out of acrylic, yes. carded teeth, all of yes. that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Like I said, I've been dabbling kind of in and out of it. So we have a tree shape scanner and a seagull printer. And I am going on a course this September with a gentleman you probably know called German Versteg. You may have seen. Name sounds familiar. Yeah. He's in Holland. So I'm I'm over to do a two-day course with German in, in September to try to push it on a little bit more, you know. What are you looking to do? Print your finals? Um. Not necessarily. I mean, look, I've had a lot of conversations with people ab- about digital. Do I think that digital is, is a better end result? In my opinion, no. I think, mm-hmm. I think nothing beats handmade at the moment. I've had this conversation with a colleague of mine in Australia where he, like, I suppose like every clinic or laboratory around the world, people have issues hanging on to staff or there, there's a shortage of dental technicians around oh, the world. Oh, absolutely. Yeah universal <laughs> yeah so one of the guys I, I spoke to said he's invested in the whole digital thing and bought the package and a pm7 and he's milling in-house and he said this milling machine is the best dental technician i ever i ever hired he works seven days a week without holiday pay and like what he had said is i suppose the 10 percent that i'm always after i i think possibly a lot of what i struggle for or what i want maybe the patient doesn't necessarily want the same Elvis that I want. Yeah. So the main thing that people want is they want comfort. They want function. If the teeth are the right color and they're in the right place, 99.9% of them will be happy. Yeah, I get that. Um, a lot of what I try to kind of add to it or bring to it, I think is for, for me and not necessarily for the patient. I just can't surrender that part of it. Not at the moment anyway. I'm a control freak. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of removable technicians are. I mean, a lot of people have mentioned on this podcast the amount of time we spend on areas that are never seen. Absolutely. Yeah. What is it that you bring to a patient that the patient might not even know about? I would say like even like uh, gingival characterization and so on. 
I went and done some courses with, uh, you probably know, I've heard of a guy called Carl Fennick as well. So uh, Carl is a, a clinical dental technician based in the UK who introduced me to the Dr. Abe technique Yeah, back in, in 2015. And I've done some kind of courses with Carl and he's, he's probably... I think one of the best guys in the world of doing gingival characterization. He's, his work is just amazing. And I've been on some courses with him and uh, like one-on-ones doing a uh, composite gingiva and so on. And so what we did was kind of, I, I went and done some one-to-one courses with Carl and then brought back some kind of demo stuff as well to show patients. And there's something about when you, tr- I think when you write, try to recreate a piece of nature, it gives a huge boost of self-confidence to a patient that says somebody is going to the effort of trying to give me something that really looks real and believable. Yeah. And I, I think it can give somebody a huge, a huge boost of self-confidence. Like, even if you say that, you know, unless people have got a high smile line, how much of the gum line do you see? Very little of it. But Very little, yeah. Yeah, but the patients, you know, feel it. They just feel a little bit more confident with it. And like, we've even gone to the trouble of putting you know, amalgam type fillings into teeth and so on to try to really make them real and believable looking, you know? Wow. What kind of composite do you use? I use a a Nexco. Oh, there you go. Yep. So I I would use Nexco, but recently kind of, you know, doing Nexco like is is time consuming. Mm -hmm. You know, know, if I was to sit down and do, we'll say a full, full, I want a whole afternoon. Oh, really? Take you all all day to do it. It would take me an afternoon at least because like, I would have to cut back. I would have to sandblast and prep the surface and then paint on the bond and then layer by layer by layer, build up this color and, and character and so on. Now, I've recently kind of started using more of the, the candler in flask color. So like a salt and pepper type technique inside before we inject as well. So we've had yeah. um, we've had a guy over here called Joseph Rattoni. You may have seen some of his work. He's a friend of mine and a colleague from Hungary. Oh, wow. Joseph does some beautiful uh, work with candular colors. So I started kind of doing more and more of that. And I'm, I, I think myself, I'm getting better at it and, and I'm getting nice, subtle results, but an awful lot quicker than I was with composite. So instead of a whole afternoon, it's... Instead of a whole afternoon. Three yeah. fourths of an afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I can, you know, I mean, I can, I can layer up a full full in ten or fifteen minutes. Oh wow, that is a huge savings. Yeah. It's, a huge, it's a huge saving, and what's particularly beneficial about doing it in flask as well. So we do a lot of, you know, Doctor Abe dentures here suction. So I'm, I'm, I'm a Doctor Abe instructor as well. So I teach this technique here in Ireland, and Doctor Abe's technique is built around using oral mucosa as a stabilizer for the denture. So wanting your dentures in contact with oral mucosa. When you take your functional impressions and you restore that shape and contour, you don't want to go adjusting that in the final denture. So if you've built up this shape and contour and you've waxed it up exactly like that, if you do a salt and pepper technique in the flask, you're not cutting it back and trying to build it back to that shape after. If you do it in composite, you need to make yourself an index, so a key whether that's being in plaster or with, with lab putty, you need to build your composite back up to the exact same shape that you had in wax beforehand. So that's another kind of benefit of doing it in flask rather than after. Okay, see, I think I'm following here. So we'll talk about this, the suction denture. Yes. It's heard about a lot. There's a few people here in the States that are into it, but not a lot. It's all about getting the correct records, correct? It's, it's the correct impressions and the correct jaw registration as well. So I stumbled across this technique as well. Like a lot of things I stumbled across in my life. But um, <laughs> again, it was, I think we were after buying an Iva base machine back in 2015. And we were sure. having some training back then. And Carl Fennick was an instructor for, for Iva Claren at the time. He was providing the training for the, the Iva base machines. But just during our, our coffee break, he put on this video of this man in japan trying to remove this lower denture with difficulty and we all kind of laughed laughed and joked about and said look it must be on a couple of locators or something (laughs) yeah in a denture so stable but but carl had actually been out to japan at this stage to learn about the technique so i contacted dr abe that was in july 2015 Mm -hmm. i went out for the first time with two friends of mine for from ireland here in february 2016 to do a two-day hands-on course in japan in Japan, yeah. Wow. 
the technique has really only been heard about in, in the Western world probably in the last kind of 10 years. And there are pockets of it here and there, but I, I suppose the difficulty that Dr. Abe had spreading this technique was that there was a language barrier. So he wasn't fluent in, in English. He's very good at it now, but he was, it wasn't always the way. So when he yeah. came to countries like Germany and he presented, people had difficulty understanding. He decided that he needed a, a set of worldwide instructors to to spread this technique if he wanted people to know about it this is the the way he had to go about it so I went over in 2016 I, I came back and I quietly kind of tipped away at the technique I cherry picked patients in the beginning I I didn't charge anybody any extra for it I just kept working and working away at it and you know I started to get some really good predictable results and got in contact with Dr. Abe about going back out there again and he asked me would I be interested in becoming an instructor mm. so I went back out the following year uh, to do the instructor course which in, involved me seeing patients not just easy to treat patients, but difficult to treat patients. So I was assessed uh, for that and I got a, a clinical qualification in 2017. So I'm a clinical uh, instructor for Dr. Abe's technique. Um, but I also went back the following year again. I'm at looking for punishment. I, I went back to get <laughs> the, the technical. You're hooked. <laughs> yeah, I went back to get the, the technical instructor qualification as well so I'm, I'm a clinical and technical instructor for his technique does it work on every patient can it work on every patient i guess is the question well i suppose the, our success rate here would be probably running at around 80 percent okay I would, I would imagine about 80 percent of the edentialist population are suitable for the technique now you get various different results, Elvis, depending on oral anatomy, depending on how reproducible the patient's bite is. Believe it or not, it's the most important thing. If you have a patient with an unstable jaw position, no matter how good your impression records might be or how well made your dentures are, if your jaw record is incorrect, the patient will shift and move those dentures all over the place. So stable jaw position, number one priority. Um, the impressions are important but not as important as the stable jaw position how quickly after you meet a patient can you determine their lack of or i can determine them now in 10 minutes now in the just by watching no no so there, there's a, a specific intraoral exam uh, for okay technique so i suppose when you're when you're looking at people for making conventional uh, dentures you know you're you're looking are there any anomalies in their mouth what size are the ridges with dr abe's technique we have intraoral things and we also have intramaxillary risk factors which are all jaw related issues so when we're looking at anatomy we look at at ridge size we look at the retromotor pads we look mm -hmm. through the retromotor what size are the retromotor pads are how steeply inclined they are do they deform? You have different types of retromolar pad that can distort on opening and closing. And we quantify everything in the patient into left and right and also into good, fair and poor. Mm. So you start to get a, a quantitative analysis of the success rate of the treatment. Now, I've done enough of it now that I can analyze a patient in, in 10 or 15 minutes. In the beginning, it was kind of like, let's see how it goes, because I, I wasn't sure exactly what I was looking at. Um, it takes time, so it does to kind of get your eye in. It's a, it's, it's a completely different approach. Well, I imagine at the beginning you thought people were good, and then as you proceeded and you tried to fit it, you turned out they were uh, poor. <laughs> look, I, I mean, I, I suppose in hindsight, I could look back at every other full fold that I made in previous years before this and say they were rubbish in comparison. Mm. Um, I had this conversation with somebody before where they said, are, are you telling me that what I've been doing for the last 30 years is incorrect. And my answer to that was, no, it's not incorrect. There's just that there is a better way. Yeah, It's closing your mind off and thinking that there's only one way to skin a cat. It's not a good way. to. I'm, I'm always trying to find new ways or new techniques to learn. Uh, if it makes the end result better and the patients are happier, it makes my life easier. It's worth hopping on a plane, go to Japan or Germany or Holland or wherever. For me, it's worthwhile anyway. Yeah. So do patients come to you? knowing that you do this technique yeah I, 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 I really i'm the instructor for ireland so i'm the, I'm the only instructor here in, in the republic of ireland and I'm, I'm probably really there are some instructors in the uk but they're not really currently training people so we train people in the technique as well so we have a training facility this is how we we came to meet patrick allen patrick has been yeah here. he's been here twice oh wow i didn't realize that he went there twice wow. yeah, he was he was only here in april just gone by 
and he was here uh, pre-COVID as well with another dent tourist, Catherine Young. Yep. So Catherine was over here as well uh, on a training course with us as well. So yeah, we train people in the technique as well. As, like we would have ran kind of pretty much one course a month pre-COVID. Um, mm. And since COVID, we've had possibly six or seven, not as as frequently as we did it before, but I don't plan on doing as many either going forward because uh, the courses took over my weekends, which are my family time as well. Sure. But did you teach clinical or technical or both? Both. So people would come over and how long? It was just a weekend course? A two-day course, yeah. There are various different, like uh, Patrick would tell you as well that, and I think like, it, you know, if you come on a course like, like that, if you're learning a specific technique, I'm going to give you all of the information that you need to get up and running. But, you know, it doesn't qualify anybody to go and stick a sign outside the door on Monday morning saying such indentures available here today. <laughs> I'm not giving people a license to do that. I'm training them and I'm here to provide whatever support that they need yeah. afterwards as well and with follow up courses and so on. But yeah, it's a two day hands on course. And we have like, um, you were asking about, can you treat everybody like we would have an advanced course as well, where you have people that have unstable jaw positions and their anatomy is really poor, you know, ridges that are pan flat and mm-hmm. uh, strong tongue retraction and no sublingual spongy tissue and things. So we offer courses for, for that as well. But the basic introduction to it, we basically, we, we provide the patients or the participants, they do the clinical and the technical part. So we give them an introduction to it, but we also bring in a live patient as well. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Yeah, so they... They get to take their own preliminary impressions. They get to do functional impressions. They get to carry a gothic arch tracing and so on. And they, they all get to experience what suction feels like by the end of day two. So we give them a good introduction into that. And then it's up to them, really, I suppose, how they proceed with the Elvis after that. Like I said, when I came back, it was probably the best part between six and 10 months before I actually advertised that I'm offering this uh, procedure. Before that, I was just wasn't confident about it. I didn't want to charge anybody for something that I didn't really know about. It was just kind of trial and error for me for the first six to eight months, you know? Well, did you even let the patient know you were trying to do it? Or was it just like, nice surprise at the end? No, it fits I, really well. <laughs> well, I did let them in on, on what I was doing. Like to give you an example, like at our third appointment for that particular type of treatment, when we're doing our closed mouth functional impressions and gothic arch tracing, that's a two hour long appointment with the patient. Mm. So you better tell them why. <laughs> no, say, Elvis, you're going to be with me for two hours tomorrow. What for? Yeah. I mean, if it was a conventional dentures you were making, they'd be in and out and probably 40, 45 minutes, but it's twice as long. You know, it's yeah. time consuming, but it's well worth the extra effort. How do you get your patients for the courses? Do you just ask your normal yeah. patients? We have a couple of patients that we call on that fit the bill for specific types of courses. So, oh, okay. Yeah. We, you want to call them actors, you can. So, we have yeah. uh, with dental actors. So, we have patients that fit the bill for the easy to treat patient. So, the straightforward yeah. patient that when you're doing your intro oral exam, they're ticking a lot of good boxes good anatomy stable jaw position but we also have patients that you know fit a lot of the the poor categories the unstable jaw position poor anatomy so we have we have different patients that we call on when we're running course i can say elvis i need you in for next weekend we've got patrick and Catherine coming from the united states and they're really good you know very accommodating they get paid a fee for it don't get me wrong they get paid a fee for giving us their Mm -hmm. time sure it's not just a two-hour appointment if you have now we generally if we run those courses there you're not going to have one patient have 10 people take impressions that are going to take two hours long they'd be exhausted after it so yeah yeah that's why we only take two participants each time oh i didn't realize the classes were that small yeah, yeah. and dr abe is the same in in japan when you go there it's two participants at a, at a time the quality yeah. of the training is better you know when it's more kind of like a one-to-one and the patients are not being kind of pulled and dragged for you know by the time that you've had your turn and, and the patient's already had two sets of closed mouth function impressions he's, he's had enough of it by by the third person you know yeah but i bet you those actors they probably what all have 12 sets of dentures <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not that we usually what we do is like we did a course recently where they all patrick was here where they all actually manufactured a complete full full but that was a three-day course 
So they were here and the, the patients came in, there was preliminary impressions done, they done the intraoral exams, they done the jaw registration, they made uh, the custom trays and the, the natometers for the, the gothic arch trays. We had the patients back in for the try-ins. And then they also processed and fitted their dentures by the end of day three. But the, oh, wow. the, the, yeah. the general two-day hands-on course doesn't involve actually fitting a denture. It just involves getting to the point of getting the suction effective impressions and the stable uh, jaw record at appointment number three. The rest of it, you'd kind of hope that it's not that it's <laughs> self-explanatory, but if they're dental technicians and they have a background in it, and if they're proficient in the biofunctional prosthetic system, that there's a specific set of templates and articulators and teeth that we use to achieve a certain result. So we don't generally tend to cover all of the technical stuff, Elvis. It's Sure. Um, it's a mixture of clinical and technical, but it's not. There's not a, a, a complete set of dentures produced at the end of day two. It would just be too time consuming. Yeah, I get it. We do offer that course as well, but it's three days long instead of two. Yeah, so you're able to determine the amount of suction during the impression. Did I catch that right? So you know before you fabricate if this thing's going to work or not. I do at this stage. Well, I've I've enough experience because I'm at it since 2016. Yeah. Uh, I know at the intraoral exam what kind of a result that I'm going to achieve for the patient. Now, I'm not saying that I haven't been surprised one way or the other still from, sure. time, from time to time, but I can predict it fairly well at this stage at an intraoral exam. I can be pretty confident with a patient that if you come in to me for a consultation and you sit in the chair, that I pretty much 99% of the time can predict what kind of result I'm going to get at the end. That's amazing. Yeah. It's the single probably best thing that uh, outside of going and doing the dentures program or the clinical program in, in the dental hospital in Dublin, going to Japan was the next best thing that I've ever done. I bet. Mm. I've never talked to anyone that did the course, but I've heard of people that have did the course and it's changed the way they do removable impressions and everything. Absolutely. But since our audience is mostly technician, Talk about the process a little bit. What's different than just your typical denture processing? Or is it not different? No, it is. It is different. Yeah. So to give you an example, if I have, let's say, for example, a dentist that wants to come on a course, I would always advise them to bring their dental technician with them. Oh, yeah. Because like I said to you, there's a clinical and there's a technical aspect to this technique. And this is where denturers have the upper hand over the dentist technician relationship because the dentist technician relationship 99% of the time here in Ireland they're not even in the same town and um, so you have work being posted back and forward or couriered back and forward yep yep if, to, to have a predictable result in a dentist technician relationship I always advise that they bring their technician along with them because if they're not singing off the same hymn sheet then the predictability goes out the window yeah no smart yeah so like to give you an example even we'll say like the custom trays that are made are fabricated to uh, to take the suction effective impressions have very specific design features built into them so they have mm -hmm. very specific shapes and contours which are designed to work around what we call different closures in the mouth so closures meaning like when dr abe developed this technique back in 1999 part of his research in Tokyo University involved him, you know, dissecting the heads of cadavers, looking at muscle orientation and insertion and so on. So his technique hasn't come about without a vast amount of, of research and so on. And so when you're making these custom trays, like if you're fabricating a custom tray for a conventional full fold, you're making it a uniform thickness, you're keeping it possibly two millimeters short of the sulcus reflection, avoiding yeah. muscle attachments. Dr. Abe's technique in, is different to that, where I told you that we use oral mucosa as a, as a big stabilizing effect on the denture. So to capture that oral mucosa and to capture these closures, there are very specific design features in, in the custom trays. So when we're making those custom trays, now I make them digitally now. Oh, okay. Previous to me making them digitally, the amount of time that it took me to articulate the case, to analyze the models, to block them out, and to make those custom trays with Natometer M took me roughly about two hours to make them by hand. Wow. Digitally? <laughs> no, digitally I can do them now and I can probably design them in maybe 15, 20 minutes. Wow. Um, 
the printer will print them in roughly about an hour. But during that hour now, I'm doing something else. So, sure, sure. Uh, I save myself. That, that's where I was saying to you that I use a mixture of digital and analog. Um, I design all those custom trays digitally now and I print them. But like mm-hmm. previous to me buying a scanner and buying a printer, I was making them all by hand. Now, when people come on the courses here, we still make them by hand because I think you need to understand the analog version of it before you understand the digital version. Yeah. I don't think you can just automatically plunk somebody down in front of a computer screen without them understanding how to make it by hand first. So we make everything by hand on, on the courses still. They don't design them digitally. Do you teach the digital part of it? or Not, just... not yet because I'm, I'm not, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm not proficient enough at it. Um, okay. I'm, I use it, like I said, that's why I'm going over to spend some time with German in, in September because I want to learn more about it. Sure. Um, so, no, I, I my plan would be in the future to offer that course as a digital version as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, do, I do have some colleagues of mine that are Dr. Abe instructors in Canada and like Eric Kakucha and uh, Peter, yep. Peter Anastasia in, in Brisbane who offer those courses both as an analog and a digital option so i would like to be able to offer that as well but i'm not proficient enough to speak on that topic elvis absolutely so process still next step a bite block no no so like there are five steps involved in in that process so what we do like at i still use a bite block as well so i actually use three different methods of recording okay uh, recording the patient's bite so we'll say when they come at their for their first appointment we would do the intraoral exam and then we would take a set of preliminary pressure loaded impressions. So they're taken with, with alginate, but some of it is syringed. So it has a different consistency. We use like mm-hmm. a, a syringe material and a base material to achieve two overextended impressions of the patient's mouth first. Once we have those models poured up, um, Dr. Abe developed a tr- an impression tray for taking a preliminary impression of the lower jaw called a frame cutback tray. It's called an FCB tray, and it's made by a company called Marita. And it's okay. it's designed with specific kind of features in mind as well for minimal displacement of oral mucosa. So it's you're trying to take the most static impression of the patient's lower jaw as you possibly can. Once you place your hands in, pa- in the patient's mouth and you start pushing on things, you're squishing soft tissue, you're pushing cheeks out of the way, you're pushing tongues yeah. out of the way. So we use, at the second appointment, we use a frame cutback tray for taking a, a static impression of the patient's lower jaw. We also then use what's called a centric tray, which was developed by, by Ivy Clara Vivident as well for mm-hmm. taking a preliminary registration of the patient's upper and lower jaw so we were trying to record the resting vertical dimension so we we mark some dots on their nose and their chin and we ask various different methods then where we get them to hum and what we do is the, the distance between the the two dots generally if people are at a resting vertical dimension their lips will be likely touching together but their teeth will be apart yeah we take a preliminary re- registration at the second appointment and we fine tune that at appointment number three. So when they come for their closed mouth functional impressions, there's a device that's attached to those impression trays called, it's called an actimeter M is the uh, the analog version of it. And, mm-hmm. and yep. an actimeter CAD is the digital version. So these impression trays allow you to take a closed mouth functional impression, but they also allow you to take a pin tracing of the patient's lower jaw. So we find out, you know, the range of lateral and protrusive movement and we find our centric relation also. Yeah. So that, that's what that two hour appointment involves is yeah. uh, it, it, it's the longest appointment, but in my opinion, it's the most important appointment of the whole lot. Well, yeah. I mean, it's all about getting the correct records for everything after that. Yes. And um, so like after that, then we obviously, we, we go to our, our try and I'm still doing the try and analog version. So we, once we have our master models poured up, they're boxed and beaded to preserve all of the, the peripheral roll on them. But also we're recording the polished surfaces. Remember, I was saying to you that we're using the oral mucosa. So depending on how strong or weak the muscles are that, that sit outside that oral muco- mucosa, mm-hmm. the patient creates very specific shapes and contours on the impressions that are specific to them. And you, to, you need to make sure that you replicate that exactly in your final denture once we have our final models uh, boxed and beaded and poured up 
we scan them again and then we print, uh, we 3D print the bases for the try-ins. Okay, yep. We, we set all the teeth up by hand then, Elvis. So they're, they're mounted on a fully adjustable articulator. Yep. And we set up all the teeth by hand and then we do our try-in and we check, you know, our aesthetic and phonetic. We check how stable the dentures are. And if everything is okay, then we, we proceed with, with waxing them down and injection molding them and finishing them by hand at that stage. Yeah, so you still do the Ivo base. We still do Ivo base for everything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What teeth do you use? We use Fenaris. So Ivo is big in Ireland, huh? <laughs> they, they are, yeah. I suppose we do use Enigma Life from time to time, and we do use mm-hmm. Visa from time to time, but I pretty much use Ivo Clar for 95% of the cases. Oh, they were beautiful teeth. We had them at the lab I was at too. We well, do use a cheaper, they do have a cheaper version called an SDCL as well, which mm-hmm. is a slight, which it's not a composite tooth. We would use them more for kind of transitional dentures. So maybe patients are having clearances and they don't want to spend so much on a, a transitional appliance. We would use them for those type of cases. But our definitive ones or a Dr. Abbey case is 99% of the time they're all with Ivoclarfenaris. Yeah. That's cool. So it sounds like this whole procedure cannot be done by a dentist alone and can't be done by a technician alone. No. It's got to be done together. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Like I said, I've had numerous inquiries of maybe a dentist wanting to come on the course, but if they, if I mention to them, you know, would you like to bring your technician along? And then they say, well, no, or my dental technician is not in the same country, which you'd be surprised. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, dental outsourcing has become, the world has become a very small place. If sure. that's the case, my reaction to them would be, don't waste your time on coming on a course if you don't have a dental technician that's on the same page. Yeah. It's just going to be a waste of your money and my time because, you know, you could send out very kind of specific records to somebody who has no idea of the technique and, and they can ruin those records. Oh, yeah. And send you back something completely different. Yeah, you could totally take those records and send them to the lab I used to be at. We wouldn't know what to do with them. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Do you even waste time doing economy dentures? Like when you say economy, we usually, we have kind of like three different tiers uh, here. So we did have kind of four tiers. So we did have um, a contract here as well with the the health service executive here in Ireland uh, where people are entitled to have dentures made free of charge. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, but... We did have a contract up until three years ago, but we surrendered it three years ago. COVID kind of had, a, I suppose, a, a big impact on that or the safety yeah, of I us. imagine. We, like for us to make that, we were getting paid a very, very small fee for manufacturing those dentures. Mm-hmm. It still meant you had to see the patients four times. It still meant you had the recalls. But to try to make that scheme work, it meant that I needed to see 20 plus patients a day to make it pay. Oh, that just wasn't feasible for us during COVID. It wasn't safe to see that many people a day. Like we still have a one in one out, even though, you know, I'm not saying COVID is, it hasn't gone away anywhere, but people are not paying no, as much yeah. anymore, but we still have a one in one out policy here. We don't have an open door. You can't breeze in without an appointment. Oh, wow. So it's, it's pretty much a one in one out with the pre COVID it, it, to try to make that scheme work, it didn't mean that we had to see 20 plus patients a day. So I see generally now somewhere between kind of nine and 11 patients a day. So half the number that I used to deal with before. Yeah, but you're doing more, you're doing better, better work, more quality, work. charging more. Yeah. That's it. And, and like I said, I, I when I was seeing 20 plus patients a day, there were five of us here. But honestly, like I wasn't making any more money Elvis all I was doing was creating jobs for people and headaches for myself yeah I get Um, that that's a universal problem too (laughs) I was was no better off at the end of the month uh, where now it's kind of like it's it's a much higher quality a smaller volume of people I have far more time to to dedicate to the clinical and the technical side and I'm happier patients are happier that's great yeah. Paul, what a great story, man. I super appreciate you coming on this podcast to talk about it. You're more than welcome. I appreciate the time difference. I know it's pretty late there for you, isn't it? I, I mean, it's not it's not late at all. It's only quarter past five in the evening. Oh, nice. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, no, thank you. It's great stuff. And can people contact you if they want to learn 
and take your courses? Yeah, they can absolutely. Our courses for the remainder of this year are full. Um, I haven't got a schedule yet for next year, but they can make contact with me at info at mcnallydentureclinic.ie. Okay. So yeah, if they're interested in taking a course next year, drop an email, get on a waiting list. Drop, drop an email or get in contact with Patrick Allen and he'll send John over here. There you go. Good old Patrick. Yeah. Awesome, Paul. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye to your dog. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Have you unlocked your dental laboratory's potential through 3D printing? Well, with the Astiga, you can. Did you know Astiga has over 500 validated materials on their open material system, and it's growing every day? By harnessing Astiga's proprietary layer monitoring technology with its smart positioning system and its integrated internal radiometer, as a laboratory, you'll be able to produce any indication you desire. It doesn't care if you models, splints, temporaries, or heck, even permanent crowns. Your investment will be future-proof with the Sega's rugged engineering, providing you with a fast, accurate, and repeatable machine with a reputation that is time-tested in the dental laboratory industry. If you'd like to learn more about the Sega's machine or the material offerings, please visit the website at asiga.com. That's A-S-I-G-A dot com. Or contact your favorite dental reseller. And we appreciate your support of the podcast, Asiga. A super big thanks to Paul for coming on our podcast. I really am sorry that I missed this conversation. But after listening to it, I know a lot more about dentures than I did before. And I like the fact that they suck. And your accent, of course. I love that as well. It seems to me that if we can make a lower denture better, everyone should at least strive to do it. So if you want to learn more and possibly take a trip to Ireland, which is not a bad idea, drop Paul an email at info at mcnallydentureclinic.ie to find out the next time he has an open spot in his course. Guys, do it for yourself, do it for your doctors, and do it for the patient. Awesome. We appreciate it, Paul. Yes, we do. All right, everybody. That's all we got for you. We'll talk to you next week. See ya. No swimming. Poor bras. Just saying. Happy Labor Day. <laughs>